So this right brain, left brain thing that we believe as Muslims, you know, there was a man, one, I call him my beloved teacher, he taught, uh, and I read many of his books, and one day I realized, oh my God, I'm teaching what I've read in all of his books, but I've never met him. And being a Muslim and believing in transmission, I had to go and see him. He had retired, and I had to make this great effort to be, visit him in Connecticut, to live in Connecticut, to see him. And I went to see him, finally got the connection, and, uh, and then I said to him, I said, you know, I've read your books, and I, realizing, I realized I'm teaching from what you've written, but I've never met you, so I had to come because I'm a Muslim and I believe in transmission, you know, by connection, by physical presence. And he got up from his chair and he came across the room with a great smile, took my hands in both hands. He said, I'm so pleased to hear that, that you've come all this way and you made this effort. Mm -hmm. And the people that were with me said, that was him giving you the transmission. Mm -hmm. What happens between us? Every one of us. When we say salam alaikum, wa alaikum salam. Or if we say kaifa hal, even more so. I remember in Morocco, one of the shayukh, I said, used to say, he'd say kaifa hal, and they say alhamdulillah. I said, no, how are you? You know, are you, you feel like crap? Alhamdulillah, or do you feel really great? Alhamdulillah, what is it? You know, and, uh, and, he, and he said, you answer by just reality, by being truthful and honest. And alhamdulillah, ala kulli hal. You know? That's the reality. Um, but we know so much more about each other. In milliseconds, women better than men, in milliseconds we can assess another human being, depending upon, we, they, people call it women's intuition. Okay, it's, it's an inner nature. You know, when I was coming here from LA, they have these dogs now that you have to pass through their kind of arena. And they're just, they're just smelling. And they can smell the most subtle things in someone's bag 10 feet away. We're animals as well, and we know more than we realize by what we smell, by what we see, by what we hear, by the subtle movements of the body of the other person. We read all this without knowing what we read what we're reading. So right brain, left brain, our right brain goes by the words. Men, we tend to do this more typically. We believe what we hear in the words, in the semantics. And women tend to respond more to the somatic, the feeling. And the judgment that women have of the other person's character, much better than we are. We can be fooled really easily because we go by the words. But in terms of relationships, it's the tone of voice. It's the movement of the body. It's the prosody. People know this term prosody, the way we speak. Either we speak with this kind of a you know, robotic kind of flat line, or <coughs> feeling and emotion and meaning. And that contains so much. And remember that we began to learn that in our mother's womb because the first sense that became complete in us was hearing. We heard the mother's voice and the phonemes and we responded to it with sound, with hearing, which is our first. And we hear with our whole bodies. As I speak to you now, the words and the sounds are going through the air. They're also traveling over my body to your body. They're bathing your bodies. And every pore is also hearing some of what I'm speaking to you. And some, there'll be some people who will be going, understanding. You follow what I'm saying? The connection between us is much, much more active and alive than we realize. And the modern research now where they've been able to, they've been able to image right brain, left brain activity, when to, and we all know this, when I tell you this, for those of you who have not heard me before, you'll recognize the truth of it. When two people are having a conversation, and it's real conversation and exchange back and forth, the right brains in both people are active. That is not the cognitive language level, but the part of the brain that's connected more to the base of the brain and to the body. That is hearing and understanding, and they're in total sync. When they, so, so when I'm having the conversation with you right now, you're all listening, but also inside your bodies, your hormonal system, your nervous system, and systems we haven't even named are in... They're engaged, and they're learning, or not learning, 
And you may be saying, well, he's full of it, or, yeah, I, you know, I recognize this is true. But when two people are having a conversation, the right brains are also having another conversation, subtextual, sublanguage, beneath the language, between, beneath the, consci the consciousness. You know, they've had the psychologist, someone asked me the other day about the ego. I said, well, you know, we need to reevaluate all this as Muslims, and, you know, this is a term, I mean, I hear imams using this term ego. You know, that's from Mr. Freud and from, you know, you know well, we know where that came from. But it's a limited view and understanding of all of this. So this right brain, so what the, the new research is too, is not only is there a conversation going on subtextual, subconsciously between us, but that has a directive and a trajectory of its own. That's why we can be with certain people and we, oh, we discovered this, and we start talking about it, and it's very exciting, the conversation as it unfolds, because they're, they're, they're in sync, and they're in harmony, and this third, this third discussion is taking place. Something remarkable to just become aware of and see it take place. You know, to recognize, yes, this is happening. That's why I love to go to the, to the post office in my little town, and in the post office I say, oh, you know, good morning, how are you doing? And they say, oh, great, and they say, yeah. Uh, it's kind of cold today, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of cold. People say to me, oh, I really dislike small talk. I love small talk. Small talk is not small. Small talk is big talk. <laughs> Much more than these, well, yeah, blah, 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 all this information. Mary Oliver again. Wonderful poet. Anyone who's never read her poetry should check it out. I mean, she has a poem about going, a lot of her poems are about nature, observing nature, and then her reflections. Quite simply, beautiful. Uh, and what she what comes forth from her is you know this amazing thing that you know she'll re so the lines of the poem will unfold and then one line will suddenly come and oh, just touch the heart and tears will come and I used to read that I said how did she do that how did she you know and it's this subtextual reality that's coming forth from inside this vast reality of the universe of the inner self but she has a poem about being in the forest. And there's a frog. And she starts having a conversation. Well, there you are on the ground, you know, with your leaves and your, you know, all that stuff that's breaking down and all this, and, you know, the trees. And here I am above. And she has this long discussion about what it's like for the frog. And she says, and there you, there, there you are. You sit there on the ground, Buddha-like, she says, <laughs> while the anguish of language passes over your head. <laughs> and while language is a beautiful thing that Allah has provided us uniquely, we know this. Um, we have to see where it fits in the whole in terms of our state of being. So, I just uh, kind of <laughs> thrown out all these pieces. That, like I said, there's so many things I would love to share. Um, I mean, I had a list of things, you know, that we, we talk about. <coughs> You know, one, one sheikh said, uh, it was a Moroccan sheikh, he said, you know, the, the flood in the time of Noah was one of water, and the flood in our times is disconnection from each other. And that's a hard one to, it's a hard one to, you know, swim through, <laughs> to swim, to, to, to say a flood from. It's really hard. It takes real courage, real kind of jihad, real kind of big effort to bring people together. This is the value of a sheikh who brings people together under his. Now, also what happens with me speaking or the sheikh in the presence of a group of people is that person who is like the speaker or the sheikh will moderate the states that are going on inside in the right brain experiences. And that will also be collective amongst the group. And when they're together or touching or holding hands and like, you know, the Hadra, people know the Hadra? That's a good example. I mean, Sheikh Habib used to say that the Hadra, in the Hadra, wherever the highest maqam of one person is, that will be shared by everyone. We are connected in ways we don't realize, but physical connection is important. The Prophet said, when he took hand, he was the last one to remove his hand. We don't connect physically with each other, you know, like we used to. Maybe here in your community, I sense that you have a lot more than a lot of the rest of the world, more coming together, and more in the diversity 
of who's taking part with each other. As Muslims, we, I mean, we want to get to this point where we're able to, in New Mexico, you know, one of the things they have, a style they have, is being great gruff and grumpy kind of in first encounter. And if you don't realize that that's kind of a protective sort of test, are you going to manage my grumpiness and my coldness and get past that so you can meet me? And if you do and give it some time, then you come together. But the red flags go up for most of us. Something, you know, a big red flag goes up and says, oh, I don't have anything to do with that person. It's hard. Back in the day, Sheikh Abdul Qadr used to take us groups of, you know, you have this one, this one, this one, and this one, and he'd say, okay, you four, go to this place. Get in the car tomorrow morning and go. Just me. And, you know, this one I was okay with, and I had to go with this guy. This one, you know. But that experience was an incredible teaching. To discover them in time, through the thick and thin, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Unfortunately, so much of what we experience starts out good, and then we get a little bit of bad, and then it becomes ugly. <laughs> so, what I, 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 so what's the takeaway? I mean, how are we for time? It goes always much faster than so. It's been about an hour. Um, so, uh, can we make space for anybody that's needing to come in? I, I don't know how we make space if there's only so many chairs. But I please, I'm please in love. Thank you for, for, for showing up. And thank you right now for the attention because as a speaker, I, I, my, I am fueled and inspired by the attention that's there. And when the attention is not there, I can feel it. But I will say that your attention, your enthusiasm, and your interest draws from me things that I didn't even know until you drew it from me. This is the secret of the student and the teacher. One Sheikh said the, and, and we'll open this to questions, one, 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 one uh, teacher, one man said, the question, the question is the handle of the sword of answer. We have a question only because there's an answer. We're seeking to draw our sword from its sheath. And one of the great homeopaths, he said, truth is a sword. It cuts deeply and blood froze freely. Mm. <coughs> so, um, so questions, comments? So I'm going to, I don't want, I, I'm sorry that I maybe sit on someone's lap. No, I, <laughs> that's not going to happen. There's some chairs over here. Just what? Okay, that's fine. It's all good, as they say. So, comments and questions on what? Like I say, I know I've just thrown a lot of disparate pieces out there. I'd love to go into the details of connection and the loss of connection. One of the things I want to say about that, and on the, week, on the workshop, I'll go through the enumeration because, on one hand, we've lost connections. And one, one, one person very wisely said that the opposite of addiction is connection. The, the addictions are uh, efforts to fulfill something that's not taking place. We're designed to connect with each other. We're designed to, and if we do not do that, we'll be sick on one level or another. If not emotionally and mentally, as they put it, physically. Uh, but along with the loss of connection comes another important piece because we've lost connection with community, with each other, most importantly, with ourselves. How many people come to me and they've gone through this thing and really basically they can say, I've lost connection to myself. They literally will say that. And they've given up their self for others. Not that there's anything wrong with serving others because that's the highest thing we can do. But we want to do it from a whole self. We want to give out from what Allah has given us and be with that and give freely from that. And there's nothing more valuable than giving the genuine quality of ourself forth to others. Even if it's in a smile alone. Even if it's in getting angry at them. I call it the blessing of bad breath. <laughs> Yeah. 
And I and I have to remember that when when the man at the uh, at the auto parts sort of steps back from me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we all have it at some time. It's a blessing, you know, Mahadi. So loss of connection is something we find at many levels that we don't always aware of. We've lost connection with morality that is in harmony with our fatra. In a world in which they say, none of this matters. <laughs> it's willy nilly it's random, it's choice. No, no. Every creature and laws and every everything in Allah's creation has its fatra. The way in which it behaves, its limits, its boundaries, from the stone to the animal. When I was at UC Berkeley in the film department, we, one of the most popular films there was Baboon Social Behavior. And it was a study of this incredibly complex social structures that the baboons had, depending upon who they, you know, when they were born, to whom, and all these, their age, and, and they even carried down to the way they would sit. If there's a group of baboons and you look at them, if you go where there's, uh, there's apparently baboons here, right? If you go and you look at them and they're sitting in a group, that's not random. You know, it, like in the, in the Desi culture, you know, every member of the family has a different designation. It's not just uncles, you know, there's this uncle and this aunt and they, very specific things. That's, a, that's an indication of a very high context, complex, complex culture with understanding initially at its core. So the baboons behave very, very specifically. If you give food to that one, no, that one, you know, you can, that one, this one over here can't eat that. It's got to go to this one. And things, obvious things, things like elders and so forth, but there's another even more complex. We have the same thing. And so our morality, and one of the things we want to be able to, in our healing, to bring to the people who are not Muslim and who have lost their way in terms of divine guidance, is that morality is not a random thing. It's built into our nature. It's built into our nature as human beings. And it's not something we need to be uh, ashamed of, or you know, it's something we need to honor, but we need to deal with it with wisdom in relating to other people so they can begin to understand that. That our nature is what needs to be fulfilled. And our first nature, our fatra, has been offended so deeply at this point in time. We no longer have families, very little communities. The, the, the automobile, okay, I mean, to be honest, I mean, it's insanity on some level, takes us farther away from each other. But, so, so the morality is, hope for the future. You know, people come to me when I was in Beirut uh, several months ago, uh, they said, could you talk to us about our youth? And I walked into that lecture and I said, Allah wa alim, I mean, I really don't know what to tell you. But at this point, since that time, last year, or maybe longer, I've come to realize that our hope has to be with them. Mm -hmm. They have to bring the healing and they have to bring the clarity and the vision from their own initiative, from amongst themselves. And we begin to see this now in the youth, that we see them going to Washington and speaking out politically again. We see this potential in them to address their own dilemma of the devices that divide. No, actually, no, I have a 14-year-old girl who, you know, I talked to her because her mother said, could you talk to her about not having a cell phone? How, and her, how her classmates bully her because she doesn't have a cell phone. And well, I said, well, I don't know what I could say to her. We sat down and talked to her, and she was brilliant. 13-year-olds are brilliant. Mm -hmm. And we don't give them value. We don't, we don't recognize that we need to. I tell parents, listen to your teenagers. Listen to your children. I tell husbands, listen to your wives. <laughs> One of the great prescriptions I've given through the many years is, you know, husbands, ask your wife, how am I doing in a scale of one to ten? Once a week. And then when they say three or two or even seven, then you say, well, why? And then the secret of this is then you shut up. You don't say one word. <laughs> you just listen. And then you do, if you can, one of the things, pieces of advice I'll give everybody right now, what do you notice takes place in your body as you hear that? What and where? This is a takeaway. If you come to the workshop, we'll go into more detail in which you can begin to 
what we're talking, what we're doing in that was they're not, we're not learning something new by being present in the body. We were present in our bodies when we were children. This is not, we, we, and we learned when we came out, we, we discovered, oh, what's this like? We said, ah, we learned how to be present, moving this limb, moving, and we had great flexibility of our joints and movements and so forth. And little by little, we rigidified ourselves. How many of you can still do a back bend? It's only because you haven't been doing back bends. As is the, this is another hikma from my teacher. As is the body, so is the self. Foundationally, stiff body is a stiff person. An obese body is an obese person, meaning certain things. A hard body is a hard person. Soft body is a soft person. A graceful body is a gracious person. This is something that was part of ancient knowledge, wisdom. It's been forgotten. I mean, now we do yoga and, you know, and the movement, movement, what do you call it? People familiar with the movement, movement? I know a lot of young internet savvy folks with <coughs> the movement, movement. You know, flexibility of the body, being in the body, embodied cognition. Anybody know that term? Embodied cognition, knowing with the body. People will stop muscle memory, but no, it's much broader than that, much deeper than that. Um, so, questions? Yes? Um, so, I just I came in when you were talking about prophetic food. About which? Prophetic food, which means like almost no food. But yes. I had a question around um, halal and tayyip. Um, so. Well, this is halal and tayyip. This is something that's been discussed a lot, and I mean, it's something to get a handle on, I think, pretty early on in terms of understanding your Islam. What is Tayyip? And now this, you know, 20, well, I became a Muslim in 1969, and at that time I ate only organic food, you know, and, uh, and so I was kind of disappointed when I discovered that the halal butchers had these disastrous animals that were toxic and so forth. So Tayyip means it's, it's a healthy, it's healthy, fed in a good way, it's raised in a good way, and it's, uh, it has all that Tayyip, all that good things to it. But these are things we need to get clear on really early on in our understanding. But I think you know that already, don't you? Well, yeah, so I'm, just, I'm looking for a deeper understanding of it because I can't find a lot of information. Really? Yeah, I'm but really you know, know what Tayyip means? Well, so it means, my understanding of Tayyip means wholesome. Wholesome, that's one way of putting it. So it means okay, it means good. But, uh, you know, if you do any research, I mean, there's lots, if, you, if, you, if you're an internet person, you go online and if you begin to look at the way modern uh, food, not just meat and meat and those, you know, animals are the way they're treated and the way they're processed, and it's uh, pretty scary, to be honest. So there's a new movement amongst the younger generation now, amongst Muslims, for Tayyip and the Biha. You know, uh, so we want to integrate all these things and say we want to integrate all the aspects of our being. We want to integrate that and as we are in ourselves, so will our circumstances be. The more we're whole beings, the more, or as my son used to say, whole beings, the more we're whole beings, the more we'll be, uh, we, will, we will establish wholeness in our lives. One, uh, there's, anyone know this book called Pattern Language by Alexander, who's an architect and city planner kind of person? Someone? No? Uh, anyway, it's a book of kind of aphorisms on the way we design and live in structures and communities and so forth. And one of the things he says in that, he says, anyone who works in a place distant from where they live, there will be an irrevocable split in their being. Now, we can hear this and we say, oh, that's probably true. But what do we do about it in the modern world? That's the next question. It's not so easy. People drive to... We drive all over the place. And this, this business of cars is... I mean, with some perspective, if we can achieve that, we have to see this is insanity. It's insanity. From so many reasons, on so many levels. Anyway. So, yeah. Ta uh, Tayyib and, you know, Halal and Tabiha. Yes. Could you tell us what brought you to Cape Town? <laughs> Uh, actually, I, I came to see my dear teacher, uh, Sheikh Abdul Qadir Sufi. And uh, could you tell us about your other teacher? 
more. Well, I've had to, I've, the last have been generous because my, I mean, it was many, many years ago in the 70s, early 70s, when uh, Sheikh Al Khadr said to me, you should do medicine. And I was shocked. What? I was an artist, I was a musician, I was a theater person. And then, it made, but he told me that and I realized I've loved this topic and subject since I was a really young child, when I was five years old. <laughs> Found this book of Encyclopedia of Natural Health. And, and I studied plants and studied nature and studied science and all this stuff and it all realized I'd been in, on this path all this time. And by his wisdom, you see, he, and from that day on, I have loved researching and studying and learning and as much as I can, practicing with people to help them find well-being. So um, my teachers have been, you know, I, it's been individuals. I've had this by love, I had this good fortune not to go to the university and get a degree, but to have one-on-one -on -one teachers, you know, on many different topics, from psychology and psychologists that are well-known to one of the best physicians and, you know, graduates from UCLA, who taught me, he said, I'll teach you modern mainstream medicine, that's easy. What you're doing is hickamate, that's difficult. <laughs> and homeopaths and so forth. So I've had one-on-one -on -one teachers. And I recommend that, you know. I recommend going to one-on-one -on -one teachers, having mentors, mentors that you connect with. Remember that we gain with this right brain kind of, not verbal, but states of being, we learn from each other. We take it on from each other. We know this is in our tradition. You know the famous thing, you, you, you go and you serve the teacher by sweeping the floor. You get it by just being there and by doing that, by Allah's design. This world, we believe in the unseen and we somehow forget that. Dali kafitam. For those who give out from what Allah has given, but also for those who believe, for us who believe in the unseen, we believe in the unseen. Hello, let's not forget that. And the unseen is a much more vast reality than this result of the unseen. So, yeah, my beloved teacher was named, his name is Dr. Alexander Lowen, and he was in Connecticut, and he taught what he called the bioenergetics and being really working with the body and being, he's the one that said that, you know, a soft body is a soft person, hard body is a hard person. And that's the kind of, was it a part. understanding this foundational, the foundations upon which the self is constructed. Now there's so many other things we need to, purification of the self, what's that about? My study of trauma, which, you know, is something that's come about more recently, we've all been traumatized. The world is full of trauma and we have trauma, trauma literally means a wound, and when that wound has not been healed, we suffer from that wound in some way, or the scars of it. But Allah is generous, and He does not sentence us by anything that's happened. He does not sentence us. He challenges us. But the more difficult the circumstances and the more difficult the things have been that we've come out of, the more knowledge we have and the greater wisdom we have by having come forth from that. We see this, if we look at it, we see it in the world in many, many, many places. People who have gone very difficult, gone through very difficult things. They come forth with wisdom. And with that wisdom comes compassion and, uh, and love for all of it. A genuine love and, and genuineness. Being real. So, yeah, but alhamdulillah, you know, uh, Imam al Ghazali, he said that if we really want knowledge and wisdom, Allah will send it to us. They'll come pounding on the door. If we really want it. Saying, I'm here to teach you. It might be the neighbor next door who's angry, but that's going to be a lesson too. Inshallah. What else? Yes. I'm curious to hear, you mentioned the right brain, left brain. Yes. As well, you mentioned Detoxing the brain, sleeping, in your opinion, on the right side is the best? It's not my opinion, it's the opinion, well, it's hadith, best to sleep on your right side. And but it's, it's the opinion of the modern biologists who study these things, yes. Additionally, we're supposed to eat also with the right hand. Yes. Do you have any explanation why not left, why right? Well, we're designed to have right and left 
realities, you know, and we know that the Quran refers to the people of the right, people of the left. Um, but, you know, a lot of that, I mean, I, there's no one single simple answer, but our right hand is also our hand of volition, of decision, choice. But also, uh, it's, you know, traditionally it's the hand we put food in our mouth and we you know, clean ourselves with the other hand. So there are lots of different indications of that, but um, the fact that we have a right side and a left side is quite remarkable. I mean, that's something. Addition, uh, the reason I'm asking yes. is okay. I'm left handed. Okay. So, the law is generous. The law is generous. I mean, <laughs> just, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a scholar of Fekka to say just do the opposite because that can be quite confusing. <laughs> okay. Well, I was just thought that ask, so. Yeah, fine. but I mean. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, but the way that our, and we're not only right handed, people are right handed or right legged, they're right eared. They're right eyed. In other words, we have these favors on both sides. Maybe I should sleep on the left side. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any time right now to get into these things like sleep. You know, the importance of sleep in modern research uh, is so remarkable. I, I say this over and over. That so many of the textbooks need to be rewritten. The nervous system textbooks. There's so much new material in the past 10, 15, very short period of time, exploding with information and studies that change everything. The textbooks need to be rewritten. Sleep. You go to the best books on sleep, the textbooks that have been on. I, I have them on the shelf. I, there's two books on sleep that I replace those with overnight, I mean, without any doubt. Uh, so, you know, so many things have changed in terms of this understanding of where we are. But like I say, if we begin to look at the, all this research, it supports what we knew all along. It's like one of my favorite sayings from Mark Twain, which I call him, people know Mark Twain? Mm -hmm. He was a Hakim in the U US. <laughs> I refer to him as Hakim. He said, isn't it amazing that the ancients were able to seal all of our modern scientific secrets? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, this catching up and reevaluating. Not, not that you know that we knew all that. No, this is this time, and this time has its needs, its peculiarities, its peculiarities, but our foundational principles should still be not only useful but important in terms of what we do here in this present, whether we're in politics, medicine, anything. So, Charlie, what else? Uh, could you say a few words? About, could you say a few words about uh, traditional Hikma perspective on the psychosomatic? Whether it's a brain well, the, the traditional point of view on psychosomatic. Now, psychosomatic is a modern term. We are whole beings from a traditional point of view, and all things take part in our well being or our illness. All aspects of ourself, as one homeopath said, from our innermost spiritual to our outermost physical. In the traditional model of what people also understand as Islamic medicine, which is actually Greek medicine, pretty much part and parcel of Greek medicine. It, all the things of the emotional states, the mental states, the constitutional type, the mizaj was understood in terms of the balance of earth, air, fire, and water. Jalaluddin Rumi said, I am irrevocably in this cage of earth, air, fire, and water, in this, ex in this world, in this existence. I once, in Bahrain, I once gave a workshop and I asked the group, maybe a couple of hundred people, I said, could people share their experiences of very powerful religious experiences, spiritual experiences? And I got four volunteers, and each one told his story. And then I went back and said, okay, I demonstrated and pointed out that they described their spiritual experiences in physical terms. Something that happened to their body. They felt this and the light did that and everything, blah, blah, blah. All this was described physically. Allah placed our souls in this body, in the womb. It will be in this body until he takes it from us. And I say to myself, I say, Spirit, how are you doing with what I've done? Where I've taken you, what I've done with you, how are you doing with all that? And this is a kind of question we need to ask ourselves, our core reality. 
So traditionally it was understood at earth, air, fire, and water, but the people who teach that and study that in the modern world, they, it's a bit simplistic in their approach because we're very, very complex. We can have a structure of any kind that has a certain amount of earth, air, fire, and water, and we can have another structure with the same balance of those things, but it's how they mix and how they come together that makes the difference. Character has always been a part of our understanding of being, purification, well-being, and wisdom, really. They say that the Prophet and all of the Prophets, peace be upon them all, were, were the most perfectly balanced of the elements. And that not only the perfectly balanced, but by that meaning the most beautiful and exquisite admixture of the way in which they come together. Yes? So when we say, well, what would you, people come to me and so say, oh, my, my massage is, I'm hot and wet, or I'm cold and dry. And I say, well, okay, fine. But how are you? <laughs> you know, and what are you? What's the reality? Because, again, if we, we are these complex universes, with each moment and each instant of our day, of each and every, every year, building and constructing this sense of self inside, not up here in the brain. We have our autobiography. It's a small portion of what we are. The, that's the weakness and the shortcomings with due respect to the psychologists of talk therapy. Not that it doesn't have its place, because we can with talk, we can inspire, and we can help a person access this vast self inside. But we're all we're all unique in that sense. We've all, you know, had very peculiar and specific and particular unique experiences every second of every minute of every day of every year. And that composite has built this sense of self inside. Although we have this other narrative that we carry with us, well, I came from this, I'm this, and you know, my bath, ethnic background, and this happened to me, my father did that, my mother did this, and I blah, 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 and I went to the school. All that <coughs> is not untrue, not unfluential, not in, uh, what, uh, it's influential, yeah, it's affected us dramatically. And depending on what it is, it enables ourselves to purify yourself, but I would suggest when we have such a vast, reality that's not literal and it's not semantic that's why the work I do with trauma has to do we call it somatic therapy dealing with the body dealing with the sensations in the body and accessing this vast thing without a pre-designed analytic an analytical agenda but allowing what wants to emerge and come forth in emergent knowledge from the person so the tradition, and, and people say, well, you know, uh, I think I may have mentioned dessert. I'm not sure if I said that today, but people say, you know, can you teach us about prophetic medicine, about and, and the medicine of the prophets? I said, yeah, it's called Islam. <laughs> That's it. But we, we need to look at it in its whole, in its wholeness, and take it on, and begin then to see how far we are from it in the way we live, and do what we can to work in that direction. And to develop what Allah has allowed us to develop, resilience in the face of these things, the face of the modern world. The more resilience we have, one of my teachers said, real health is that uh, a freedom to be with this kind of people, be with that kind of people, eat this kind of food, eat, to be in this climate, to, be, to have this flexibility and fluidity of abilities and capabilities of resilience and managing these different situations. And that's capable, we're capable of that in the self if we learn how to develop the self in that manner. Yeah. The last statement uh, that was that gave, uh, that, does that mean one can also go and eat by McDonald's and still uh, don't feel that one must really up? Can you, does that mean a person can eat bad food and... Yes, and, uh, because of the circumstances. And, yeah. Uh, uh, well, here's the thing. I mean, I remember early on in my practice, I'd see people come to me and they were health. A side note, McDonald's in Cape Town is halal. I'm sorry? Side note, McDonald's in Cape Town is halal. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed that. Say it again. Footnote, the McDonald's in Cape Town is halal. Oh, okay. <laughs> but where does the animal come from? <laughs> Tayyib. There's our Tayyib. I mean, I consider it pretty important important. I mean, right now we're confronted with something that we just sort of, some of us know and we pay attention to it, but we don't do anything about it, which is we're killing ourselves. 
We're poisoning ourselves. Monsanto's spraying poison everywhere in the world and they're getting away with it. And what do we do about it? I mean, I always wonder, it's very curious in Blackwater, when the Iraqi war ended, they went to work for Monsanto. What, were they, what are they doing with Monsanto? What businesses do they have, you know, paramilitary group working for this company? I don't know. I don't want to be conspiracy theorist, but that's pretty scary. So, so you know, I mean, we need to do these things. I mean, what I, like I say, we have to look to the young people, you know, that to change these things because, you know, we're not going to do it. The people in place, I mean, you know, they're, they're victims to it. So, so eating, so when, it, when you know, the traditional understanding of eating and nourishment from the medicina was a beautiful, deep understanding of wisdom. We begin, because when we eat and nourish ourselves, it's not digesting something. It's so much more than, it's transmutation from one kingdom to another kingdom. It's the transmutation of vegetable, mineral, animal, into human, and not only into the human kingdom, but into our own particular kingdom. This nose came from the carrots I ate in a very short time. It wasn't the one I had three years ago. This is a different one, but I made the same one again. <laughs> so, one, one, uh, one of the great teachers, he said, that transmutation from vegetable, animal, mineral takes place in the plant by the light of the sun. That transmutation in humans takes place by the light of the self. And the more the Ibn Sinab back to Ibn Sinab back to the people ask the Prophet what's the best dish, meaning what's the best food to eat? And he said, so I said him, he said, the one with the most hands in it. Mm -hmm. Eating with uh, eating with others is part of our our fetra. Mm -hmm. Being with others is part of our fetra. Mm -hmm. The more you can rub shoulders, the more I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I loved it when I went to Morocco as an American and I had to I had to manage and we, you know, get used to hand holding hands with another man walking down the street. <laughs> Thank God I did. You know? And I say, touch each other, contact each other, kiss each other, whatever you know, whatever you need to do. I mean, you know, it's our boundaries, of course. <laughs> yes. This, this alludes to that we need to build up. How do we build that up within ourselves, and how do we teach this to our children? Um, because the onslaught against the self is so great. The modern work environment takes yeah. away from the feature of sleep. Okay, so this is a very good, and that's the one thing I want to make as a takeaway for you, and, and I'll reiterate this because our time is just about up. How do we make use of this? Well, all these things I talk about, I say the takeaway is begin to pay attention to what happens in your body. Remember, I said the sensations available to our bodies by Allah's design. You know, there are blind people who can see red and green with their fingertips. There are, there are blind young people who can drive bicycles down busy streets in New York City by going and by the echo, like a bat, they can determine what's happening. Our ability to develop sensation. I met a man once who was a philosopher and his world was crashed and shattered by a man who demonstrated that the senses could be developed to the degree that he demonstrated, he said, they had a discussion about, about Arabic language and they were Arabic scholars and the man, uh, the man in Calcutta was a Sufi and he said, Arabic language is not just symbols on paper. They are source forms with a reality. And he said, well, no, no, it's just some, they had a discussion, he said, okay, write a sentence. He had him write a sentence and he read the sentence by smelling it. And his life was shattered. I mean, it, it took him to Sufism, it took him to a shayat in Pakistan. But the ability to develop our senses, or there's this young man, a couple of years ago, had his art show in New York City, and his art show was these drawings, complex drawings, if anyone saw that. He made one journey with a helicopter through Manhattan, and he drew everything. He drew the lampposts, the doorknobs, <laughs> Our capabilities that Allah has given us can be polished, developed to a degree in which we have insight and knowledge and wisdom that uh, we would not have expected. But the beginning for us in our time, if there's any one single 
uh, advice I give is, what do you notice in your body? My wife has a t-shirt that says on it, what do you notice in your body? What do you notice? Where? And what happens as you pay attention to that sensation in your body? Because everything we experience, the traditional Hakims, we call, I mentioned earlier, called neuroception. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, three things bring coolness to the eye. Traditional Hakims said, everything we experience is written on the blood. That was their way of describing it. And then that blood, in turn, builds this, this body once again, and rebuilds and rebuilds. So paying attention to what you feel in your body, in all circumstances, is a homework I give. Do you know, you see something beautiful, what do you notice in your body? University of California, Berkeley, and Stanford, in the past 10 years, have both done research where they hook everybody up, they've got to do this stuff, you know, to satisfy their scientific approach. <laughs> and then they have them look at a beautiful landscape, and they discover, well, what, goes to, what happens inside? Yeah, we know what happens. Because we all do it, and we say, subhanAllah, look. Or, you know, one of my friends says, you know, we translate subhanAllah with by Translate subhanAllah it means wow. <laughs> we see the landscape and very, very specific things happen. The Japanese, they have a practice called forest bathing. Anyone know that one? Where they, there's a nod over there. Uh, which you just go into a forest. You don't need to do anything else. And this right brain, left brain thing in New Mexico, that we have a lot of native peoples, uh, aboriginal peoples, I don't know if you use that term, you know, First Nation people, and I don't know what to call them these days. But they like just to spend time and sit with each other. They, and they say, why do these white people have to talk all the time? <laughs> because they get some, they have an experience of being with them, because being with them, you know, it's being there is enough. And what's going, taking place, I guess, say this common conversation that takes place within us when we're with others, that either takes place well or it's you know, maybe not working well in harmony, but if it's conversation, it'll have a trajectory in a life of its own. So, notice what's in your body. <clears throat> when you go out and you see something beautiful, what, where, and what next as I pay attention to that sensation? One of the things I first started doing is it's better to pay attention to the beautiful things to start with. And notice that your body reacts. It's called remembering. To be in the body. Remem and remember, look at the word remember, what it means. I mean, lit in English, it means to get your members back again. I'm getting my hands back in my, <laughs> my head. I'm present again. Being present is what it's about. So, yeah, I mean, that's a simple, if you take on that project, <coughs> what do I notice in my body? The, the difficult person, which you know, all of us know difficult people, that annoying person, if they annoy you, then you're responding to their annoyance. Mm -hmm. My daughter said one day, she was 12 years old, and she said, Dad, I just realized if someone comes and they're treating you badly and they're angry, if you get angry back, isn't that like drinking their poison? <coughs> so, you know, my parents are great for this. Annoying person, siblings are great. The boss, the employee, the, 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 employee, the other person at work. Notice, if you're annoyed, where do I feel that in my body? And what's the sensation like? And what happens if I pay attention to it? Because, and I'll go into this in the workshop, that process is our nature. The how that wants to change, to change, it doesn't want to stay. I'm depressed. Yeah, well, look, look, look. relax, let it go. Let the next stage come in. But you've got to be with that depression. You've got to be with that experience. The animals are there and their sensations, they're not cut up. You know, they don't say, I've got to go to a gazelle therapist because this, I nearly, a lion nearly got me. <laughs> you know, it's designed into us by Allah. We can heal from the most severe, dramatic things, mentally, emotionally, and great degree, physically as well. But we don't pay attention to these principles, rather we try to get there and control everything with this medication, with that medication, and next thing you know, we're making everything much worse. So paying attention to your sensation is the takeaway I suggest. Uh, what do I notice in my body? Where do I notice it? And what happens if I pay attention to what I'm experiencing in my body? Sensations, including emotions. That's another statement. All emotions are sensations that take place in the body. A woman came to me one day on the street, and I said, oh, how are you? And she said, oh, um, she said, I've been in the motor vehicle department. 
and I don't know if that's the case here, but probably the Motor Vico Tomorrow is one of the most frustrating places you can go. And I said, oh, well, good luck, how was that? And she doubled up her fists, she put her elbows, and she screwed up her face, she said, oh, I could have killed them. And I said, beautiful. And she said, what do you mean beautiful? I said, well, you just expressed the motion of anger very beautifully and, you know, benignly, <laughs> and therefore you didn't kill them. <laughs> but we need to understand this principle because people are out there killing people. <laughs> and we say, oh, well, there's no reason, we don't understand. Well, it's about time we figure out what's going on there. I mean, you know, and it's not that hard to understand. Healing it and addressing it is another story, not easy. Anyway, we're going, we're going over our time. So, uh, Thank you for the attention. I, you know, I, I really appreciate. Like I say, I gain from your interest, and I discover things myself that I didn't know. That's one of the remarkable gifts from Allah. It's Allah is the one that has the wisdom and knowledge. I, we, you know what I mean? Passes through us and comes to us by His command and will. Job. So please make make make. The love, pray for me and my family, and then we show And I pray for all of you, and that we find healing, and, and that we find the courage to face the things we need to face for healing with courage, and courage that comes from the heart. That's that's courage. That's courage where it's, it resides is in the heart, core. Inshallah.